It's not personal, Sonny. It's strictly business. This is the Cleveland Real Estate Investor Podcast with Mike Riley and Mike Ferrante. On this episode, we discuss earnest money, land contracts, negotiating, and much more. Stay tuned. But first, a word from our sponsor. Hi, this is Mike Ferrante with Century 21 Homestar and the 21 Mike team. And let's be honest, sometimes selling a house can be a real hassle. If you're in the Heights area, you have to worry about those pesky point of sale violations. You have to do other preparations to get your house ready for showings. And what about staging? That's why we work with Riley Painting and Contracting to help sellers get top dollar for their house. So give us a call at 216-373-7727 or email info at 21 21mike.com. The 21 Mike team, your one-stop shop for buying and selling. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Saturday morning, early August. It's a lazy summer day, about 80 degrees here in Cleveland. Going to get a little warmer. We're actually going to touch 90 in a couple of days, and then we'll get back to normal Cleveland weather. And with me is my sidekick, Mike Ferrante. Good morning, Mike. Good morning. Great morning for a podcast. And just a just a heat check. How many um, coffees or espressos have you had so far? Well, we're one decaf tea and about uh, ninety percent of a cappuccino into the day, Mike. Okay. Well, let's just indulge the audience here. So, why do you start out with decaf tea and then go to the <laughs> high test? I'd like to figure that one well, out. Uh, all right. So there's actually a, a short story here. My, my wife said something to me one day that, that just rang true. So she said, look, when you wake up in the morning, you have to hydrate. You, you've you been sleeping for six, seven, eight hours, whatever it is you sleep, and you haven't drunk anything. So first thing you should do in the morning is hydrate. So, of course, caffeine dehydrates you. So um, after my kidney stone about a decade ago, I switched mostly to decaf. Uh, but definitely each morning I start with something that hydrates me. Okay, good. So you're hydrated and you're awake. It's a perfect combination for a podcast on a summer day in Cleveland. Yep. So, all right. Okay, well, as you probably heard on our lead-in from our engineer, Amari, um, it's nothing personal. It's business. So we're going to go through a couple of topics. The first topic is earnest money. So, Mike, walk us walk the novices through what earnest money is about. Yeah, so it's a deposit that buyers put on almost every real estate transaction that counts toward their purchase. It's other. It's also called good faith money. So it's a deposit they put down. It's usually held by the title company or occasionally by the real one of the real estate brokerages involved. Very rarely, it's held by the seller. And uh, sometimes that money is lost in a transaction by the buyer should they typically break the contract without a good reason. In other cases, if there's a contingency in the contract, uh, often that money will go back to the buyer. Okay, so it's sort of like uh, you're booking a rental, vacation rental. And let's say it's on an ocean front. Now, the hotel has these properties in peak season at a premium price. They are also extremely desirable, easy to rent. So if somebody calls and says, I want to rent this uh, hotel room right on the ocean front, they're going to require you to pay a deposit. And if you decide, well, I changed my mind, then you lose that deposit. So now we in the Cleveland real estate market, we have a lot of properties for sale and you can equate them with uh, oceanfront properties. It's, it's a seller's market, right? That's absolutely so, right, Mike. I love the analogy because uh, we were just looking to book something last night and we noticed that there were varying policies on cancellation. So some of them said, hey, if you cancel by this date, no problem. But if you cancel too close to your booking time, you lose all or part of your deposit. Uh, and that's kind of what we're experiencing now in the Cleveland market is that those terms are becoming less and less flexible for buyers because it's a seller's market. And like a lot of podcasts we've had 
uh, over the last year, we have been adjusting to something we've never seen before, which is a seller's market in Cleveland. An LA market has come to Cleveland now. And there are a lot of issues here that we have to adjust to as a result of that. One is price. It used to be that we want to hit that price of that house right on the money so that it doesn't sit there. And we would make a price adjustment in two weeks or three weeks uh, if we, we didn't get any offers. Well, now in a hot market, you know, we're testing the upper limits of a property. And if we don't get a response in a few days or under a week, we make the appropriate adjustments. So all these are new things that, well, especially you, Mike, you're the, you're the realtor, but we've been buying and selling homes, you know, working with you for over 10 years. But these are the things that we've had to make adjustments to. And one of the other factors we have to adjust to is this issue of earnest money. A comment? Right. So two things. First, we've seen sellers markets before in Cleveland, but nothing like this. You know, this is like the storm of the century. You know, people talk about, oh, well, we've, we've seen storms, but, you know, nothing like this. So that's that's one thing. The other thing is, yeah, absolutely. Because of it's, it's the storm of the, of the century, uh, there's things happening that we've just we're shocked at and we say, wow, you know, this is something that has never happened here in this market, but we have to adjust. Yeah. Well, let's then go to earnest money. It's the old way was deal fell through. They got their money back, right? That they yeah. Well, down. and I've, and, and I'll tell you this. So just to give you the other side of the coin, we were starting to see for a while, uh, lower and lower earnest money. We were starting to see agents writing offers that said, look, we're not even going to turn over our earnest money until after inspections. And the rationale was, well, you know, why collect the earnest money if by chance the deal falls through after inspections, we're just going to end up giving it back to the buyer. Nowadays, if you want to be competitive as a buyer, not only are you you know, not waiting till after inspections to put up your earnest money, you're putting up more earnest money and the terms are becoming less and less flexible, just like those hot uh, vacation rental properties that you're talking about. Right. Now, we, we had an interesting conversation the other day, which prompted this podcast, which was, when do you give the money back? You know, uh, if or do you give the money back or do you write that new purchase agreement or contract for the house where you say this is non-refundable. So just elaborate on, on those changes. Yeah, so it's, it's you know still something that to use the word I used, um, I'm still noodling over. And uh, you know I think certainly you're gonna see the terms get more and more restrictive. You know, we've had conversations about making it non-refundable from day one, as you put it, hey, that buyer better have their ducks in a row because if you're seriously gonna make an offer and we've got 10 other offers waiting in the wings, why should we choose your offer over all, all the other offers? Exactly. Um, and then you say, well, it, but your, your reply the other day was, well, that may kind of lessen the number of buyers that come into it if they, they read that this is non-refundable. I mean, elaborate. Uh, I think, yeah. Did I, think I certain, say that the right way? Yeah, right, right. So, it, well, the way I put it was, if, if you're selling a house, and I'm not saying, you know, anyone, if a seller is selling a house, and up front, they say, look, if you're going to buy my house and from day one, your earnest money is non-refundable, just like the vacation rental, I may say, well, you know, what if I have a, you know, like, what if I get sick a week before my visit? Maybe I don't want to roll the dice on renting that property. Maybe I'll go to a different property. So, you know, the conversation we were having was, you know, how far do you take it? And, and at what point does it tarnish the product? that you're trying to, to, to sell. And so that's, you know, I, in, in my mind, I'm still noodling on that and, and weighing what's, what's the best route right now. But certainly as the seller's market continues here in Cleveland, more and more of these terms have to be looked at to say, hey, just because we've done it that way in the past doesn't mean that's the right way to do it now. Okay, so we're, we're looking at it, but we got to pull the trigger. We've got a couple other properties that we're looking to sell uh, in the next month, going through our inventory. We bought a couple interesting properties, but we're going through our own portfolio and selling. And I don't do not want to be hostage 
to somebody's incompetence uh, getting financing or et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, uh, well, that's for, like that's right. uncommon. Sellers, sellers say that all the time. You know, they're pissed when a deal falls through. They, their, their response was exactly your response. But Mike, if this deal falls through, I've been off the market now for two weeks in the hottest seller's market that in, in memory. So, you know, what's my compensation for, for that? So that's, that's the conversation. And certainly as I sit down with other sellers, that's going to be a conversation. We're going to talk about, hey, what do you want to do with regard to this earnest money negotiation? You know, I, I think it's a case by case basis. I, I think that each seller is going to have to make it, make the choice of how do you want to do it? Well, let's, let's, ha- let's uh, help these sellers make a choice instead of going into theater. We're in a, we're in a, we're in a hot seller's market. You've got a property that's in a white hot seller's market, you know, like the Royal Heights or Fernway or, or, or whatever. And you have fixed up the house. It's clean. It's uh, point of sale compliant. Windows are washed. And you priced it, you know, a little bit on the high side. But, you know, you're not asking for a million dollars. But you're asking a, a fair price. Now, the next thing you have to do is when these offers come in, make sure that the earnest money is you know, north of 5,000, you know, if it's a $300,000 house, I want 10,000 down and you lose it. If you don't, if you don't follow through and we have a short uh, inspection period. Yeah. I get that. They, you know, they want to inspect it, but the only contingency would be, you know, they find, uh, you know, there's plutonium in the basement. Okay. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Okay. I'm not talking about a broken sash cord. I'm talking about some, some inspection, report that's going to, you know, that's a, that's a major red flag. But even then we have to, in the contract, spell out uh, what, uh, what is, um, allows them to walk away. Right. And Mike, you know, we, I know we're going to get to inspections. I know we're going to get to inspections, but that's something we got to talk about too, is the old way of doing it was, Hey, most contracts say after inspections, you can accept it, you can reject it, or you can ask for repairs that has changed. So I'm I'm going to leave that hanging out there so that people got to listen a little more to hear us talk about inspections, but, you know, back to the earnest money conversation, you know, I was, like I said, I've been thinking about this. And, and so here's a, here's a, how can I put this? I said earlier that each seller has to just d- decide what they're going to do. And you said, let's help them make their dis- decision. The reason I say that, that you, I think you have to think about things on a case by case basis is what if your house is listed for 250 and you get 260 and it's a good offer, but then someone comes in and says, look, I'll give you 280 and maybe the terms are very favorable and it's t- literally $20,000 more than your next best offer. But they say, look, I'll make my earnest money non-refundable after inspections. How about that? You know, I think you have to at least look at that, especially if the payoff is is twenty grand. But you know, certainly the we have to talk about these 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 terms and realize it's a seller's market, and you know, hold people more accountable and not be the one who's having to always take the hit on the on the seller side. That that was the conversation we had. Exactly, but I think, uh, but the the key thread in all of this is. The realtors in Cleveland have to spend more time on a subject like uh, earnest money than they ever had to before. That's right. That is, I mean, you get somebody who's not even thinking about that when they're writing up a contract. You have a a realtor that's not up to to speed on what's going on in this seller's market. I mean, you know, if you're in L.A., I'm sure if you talk to a realtor in LA, and in fact, maybe we should get a, a realtor uh, from LA on on the next podcast or two. They would laugh at you if you said, you yeah. know, what you could. Uh, oh yeah, well, you got two weeks to inspect. Hey, you know what? You don't have two. You have two hours. You take <laughs> it or leave it, right? Yeah. No, certainly. You know, I've heard stories about, you know, from different peers I have uh, across the country and the way things are done differently from region to region is uh, huge. It's it's absolutely huge. And, you know, to your other comment, you know, I'm guilty of that too, Mike. I, I get, you know, I'm doing things the same way for so many years. Hell, in 2008, a lot of agents were saying short sale 
bank owned property. What's that garbage? I'm not going to sell that. I'm sticking with what I know, what I'm used to. And guess what? A lot of agents disappeared because they didn't adapt. They became dinosaurs. Exactly. Exactly. Well, now we're, we're in a seller's market. And if you're going to pitch yourself to a future client, these are the things that you, you need to be bringing up the, the new realities in this marketplace. So, all right, so we'll wrap up this, this part of the podcast. So earnest money, my feeling is it's a seller's market. I do not want to have this house off the market uh, while somebody noodles around with their financing or whatever. So if we have to lose five offers, <laughs> we have three offers to look at. I'd rather have a strong three than a bunch of garbage yep. uh, well, clouding then- my view here. That's the key, Mike, because right now it's not, can you sell your house? It's what's the best offer I can get on my house. That's the difference. And if the the best offer is possibly the one that's willing to put up their money, you know, put their money where their mouth is, as they say. Right, right. And maybe I'll throw this out. Maybe in terms of uh, accepting the contract, just say we've already had this in the house inspected. There's no plutonium in the basement. The roof is, is five, you know, we're anticipating what are the red flags that are going to come up in inspection. And so it's point of sale compliant. They've done a walkthrough or maybe they're working, uh, you know, remotely. They're buying the house remotely. So they have a nice 3D, 360 degree, you know, view of the house. And you're including a inspection report. Furnace is this, roof is that, uh, basement. I mean, you're really giving some detail here. Okay, uh, radon's already been tested, the whole nine yards. So look at folks, we've already had inspected by a licensed inspector. This is what they've come up with. Your thoughts? Yeah, that's called a pre-inspection when we have that conversation all the time. You know, uh, not many people do it, but I think it's a brilliant idea to have a pre-inspection that you can hand to a buyer that says, look, here's what they found. Here's what we fixed. These are the things, other things that inspector noted. Make your decision. Right. Okay. Okay, good. Now we're going to move on to our next uh, topic, land contracts. You lead off, Mike. Those two land contracts. (laughs) Yeah, land contracts, lease option, financing by seller. These are three options that are in our multiple listing services types of financing. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know where you're going with this one, but I'm not seeing (laughs) much of this anymore. Now go back in time to 2008 to 2012 when you couldn't sell a house. I know that a lot of sellers considered it. Not only were they the reluctant landlords that we've talked about so many times where they said, crap, I can't sell my house. Let me rent it out. But you know, they, they were looking at alternate ways to sell their home, such as land contracts and, and lease options. So, so that's kind of the general statement. I, I'm going to throw it back to you for the next volley. Okay. Well, land contracts falls under my heading of it's nothing personal, it's business because land con- contracts are usually heard with a violin playing in the background. Oh, you know, we're working on our credit. We're this, we're that. Can you help us? This is our first home. We want to want to do X, Y, and Z, and but we're having a hard time. So the um, maybe it's a seller of an estate that needs work. And the siren song coming in is, well, can we move in and do a land contract for a year? That's what I've been seeing a little bit. It's not as pronounced as it was 10 years ago when sellers were desperate to put together deals to to sell their house. And a lot of them just got screwed with land contracts. When you hear that violin playing and somebody wants to do a land contract, you have a one word response. No, no is the complete sentence. Do not do a land contract, period. Just lower the price, get a good buyer coming in, price it fairly, you get your best deal, cash up front, whatever. Nice, nice, good, earnest money. But do not do a land contract ever. 
Yeah. Sellers have so many more options now. The other thing, and I'm not an attorney, so please don't construe this as legal advice, but uh, my understanding is that land contracts, uh, when they result in a default, you know, the buyer slash, well, I guess the buyer in this case, it doesn't make their payment. The seller is left with the task of foreclosure. We're not talking about an eviction. So, you know, the, the reading and learning I've done on land contract versus say a lease option is, you know, at least with a lease option where you've got a renter who has an option to buy, if they stop paying, you can evict them. But the land contract, I've always been told steer clear of it because the non-payment situation turns into a foreclosure, not an eviction. One thing I've realized in when I've seen land contract situation is that the people that are living in the house, they're renting and then they want to buy it. They do not have any experience with home ownership. They think home owners, they're still mentally and emotionally thinking like a renter. So preventative maintenance, cleaning the furnace, cleaning the gutters, you know, weeding, washing windows, the kind of stuff that the landlord used to take care of. Well, technically they are the landlord now, but emotionally and intellectually, they still think they're the renter, but they want to play at being a homeowner because they think home ownership is going to make them a lot of money. You know, that's their ticket, ticket to wealth. And, you know, quite frankly, yeah, it's, it, in some cases it is when you own real estate, but owning real estate also means real responsibilities that these people don't fully understand. And that's where I've seen these deals go south. It's not like these people stop paying their monthly amount to the land contract. The problem is, is when you do an inspection six months, eight months, nine months later, they haven't been done doing the maintenance. Now the house is worth less than it was. So if they default, which, you know, sure enough, nine months, 12 months go by, they still haven't gotten around to getting the financing. You are now taking a house that's worth, that or requires $10,000 worth of repairs and clean up. Yeah. And Mike, I'll tell you, I've been doing this a long time, uh, 13 years as a real estate agent, but many more years as a real estate investor. And so I've seen many, many deals. And out of my, gosh, how many years I'm having trouble doing the math here, 30 some years in the real estate business now, I, out of all of the land contract lease options I've seen, guess how many have actually come to fruition where the person in the house actually ends up buying it? How, you want me to guess? I want you to guess. Yeah. Zero. You're close. It was one. <laughs> one deal out of, you know, it wasn't hundreds, don't get me wrong, but dozens of land contract lease options. And there was one lady, I'll never forget her. She was in Maple Heights, a house on Libby Road. Uh, very smart lady, though. Very smart, good with her money. And she was the only one who ended up purchasing the house that she was um, land contracting. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. That's land contracts. Now moving on to our next and final chapter, negotiating, appliances, yeah. inspections. And, and, and we got to Go do ahead. inspections. Yeah. We, well, yeah. We, we teased earlier with inspections. I want to make sure we hit that one. Yeah. All right. Let's go, Mike. Inspections. We're negotiating <laughs> now. We're playing right. poker at the table, right? Yeah. Go ahead. Well, so, so I love that analogy. So we're playing poker, Mike, and here in Cleveland, as a seller, we're used to having the short stack. And now we got the, we got the, the big stack. We got all the chips. So the old, you know, the old mentality was, hey, the con- our contracts say after inspections, buyers have three options. They can accept the house, reject it, and say, no, I, I don't like this inspection. I don't want to buy your house anymore. Or thirdly, they can ask for repairs. And what we're starting to see more and more, I read an article that was saying that nationally, 20% of buyers are just completely skipping inspections. They're saying, we don't care. We are confident enough. We want this house so bad, we won't even have inspections. The next tier though, are people saying, look, we'll cross out option three. We'll either take it or leave it after inspections. 
Um, but that's the direction these types of negotiations are are going. Same with all the peripheral items. You mentioned appliances just as one thing, but you know the buyers are asking for less and less because they have to. Yeah. Well, I've had uh, we've had we have a couple deals going where two of our investors are just about to close on uh, our investment property. Now these are properties that we own that we're selling privately. And uh, I mean, we've got our Newberry house that's getting sold. Uh, Cumberland uh, is going through inspection. But what I've done with our investors is walk them through what we know after owning this house for two, three, four, five years, what needs to be done here now? Like one of the houses, the, the garage floor needs to be fixed. We, we knew that when we bought the place, but we just deferred it because we wanted to get, a tenant wanted to move in and, you know, they wanted to use the garage and that they knew that they, they, they accepted the fact that there were cracks there. So we're very transparent with our investor buyers about what, what, what we know needs to be because part of the deal is that we're going to be managing the property anyways. I want this deal to work for them. And the tenant certainly wants us to be the property manager because they've enjoyed having our, you know, A1 uh, service with uh, Leon or Enrique or the people coming over, you know, to fix a leaky toilet or whatever. I mean, usually 24 out within 24 hours, those repairs are done. So the tenants are happy. They're paying their rent on time. They're taking good care of the property. The investors are walking into a deal that is going to work for them as, as a landlord, but they still have to do their due diligence. They still have to ha have an inspector come in. And uh, I think the better we are at being transparent up front about what needs to be done, the easier it is. Your thoughts? I, I agree. You know, we, you, so you got into two different, uh, or a couple of different things there, but number one is disclosure. So as a seller, just because it's a seller's market doesn't mean that you should disclose any less. You know, your disclosure is disclosure. And in the state of Ohio, there's a form we have to fill out. And we are always as sellers uh, responsible to disclose any knowledge we have about properties. And you know, it's just good business, especially especially someone like you, Mike, and me. You know, we're looking at long term re relationships here. So, making one sale or turning over one property isn't what it's all about. You know, it's not only ethical, but it's good business. Uh, but the other part is, of course, the you see, you talked about dis disclosure, and what was the other thing, uh, Mike? There was two things. Well, inspections and being transparent about what this house needs right now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I know what I was going to say. It was so with regard to inspections, I, you know, I, we keep saying it's such a seller's market and it's true. That said, you know, I would never look a buyer in the eye and say, you should not do inspections. You know, I, I just, I got to be able to sleep at night. And if they choose to do it, you know, I can, I'll tell them, look, that's an option. You can choose to do that. Buyers are doing that. But even if, you're risking your earnest money or, or even if it's going to cost you money, I still think buyers should do inspections. Now, if you have a pre-inspection, that's a different story, especially if it's from a reputable source. But I just have a hard time with a buyer who's spending possibly hundreds of thousands of dollars on a property and says, nah, I'm not going to pay that extra 400 bucks for a home inspection. You know, even if even if, if it's just for your peace of mind, you know, if you're about to drop that kind of money, I, I still think they should have some kind of home inspection. That was the other thing I wanted to mention. Okay, well, let's move into our next. Uh, I said this was the final one. I'm going to add an addendum to our chapter, which is the negotiation of uh, not just the inspection, but, you know, we ran into some confusion on one sale with the appliances where people want, they want the appliances. Now for a guy like me, appliances uh, have real value because we're developing another property 
and we're counting on getting the washer and dryer uh, and getting that new stove we put in a year ago to put into our property. So we, so our, our position, my position has been that most of the homes that we're selling to owner occupied, they're going to bring in their own stuff. They're going to want to get their own stove, not get the dishwasher, which can be a pain in the ass, you know, to put in. So yeah, dishwasher is fine, but a lot of times washer and dryer and stove and fridge, we got to think twice whether we're going to give that away. So a lot of times we're listing our houses where appliances are not included and it yeah. becomes a negotiating chip. Uh, and if somebody says, well, I really, really, really want I, that appliances. Well, if the $300,000 house, most of the time, you know, come on, they're, they're bringing in their own stuff as opposed to like somebody who's getting stretched just to pay a hundred thousand. I, I get that where they're, they're maxed out and they're paying top dollar. Okay. Yeah maybe we throw in the appliances. Your, your thoughts? Yeah. So two things again, the number one is unless there's some unique fit to the appliance, you know, like, Oh, that was a special size because it fits that space. You know, I think that the old mentality was we need to throw in these chips, these bargaining chips, like you said, to sweeten the pot. You know, it's not that kind of market anymore where we have to be so concerned about sweetening the pot with a home warranty, with uh, appliances, with other things being included. So I think that that's changing just like everything else is is changing. And, uh, you know, same thing with, with uh, home, home warranties, for example. I think that, you know, in some cases, I, I still like home warranties. Uh, most of the time when I sell a house, I like including it just because, uh, I don't want to get that phone call from someone who bought a house that I flipped uh, saying, Hey, Mike, I was here for, uh, I just moved in two months ago. I went to turn on the furnace for the first time and the furnace doesn't work. Well, okay. All right. All right. Let me push back a little bit on that. Okay. Cause I think you're now, you're, you're still 10 years behind Mike. Look at, <laughs> you just got done telling me that these buyers are so hot to get these properties. They don't want to get inspection. Right. So why don't we get, so look at the home warranty. They're not even getting an inspection. <laughs> I mean, why is the seller throwing that in? I'm not saying throw it in, but it's, they, it should be included in the price. Let me wait, let me re rephrase it. Number one, I'm not saying you, you have to do anything anymore, but oh, I, it, I know that. Just, yeah. just to give you an example of, how, I, I have to look at things through a different filter, Mike, and we've had this conversation a million times. In fact, at our brokerage, um, if a realtor at our brokerage sells a house that they're flipping or say a rental that I decide to sell, we're required to offer a home warranty with it. That's how, that's how strict they are. You know, they just don't, it's a liability thing. It's a sleep at night thing. Wait, so, wait, wait, I, I get, I get, and I'm trying, I'm trying to step in your toes here. I get offering people, the, the seller, a home warranty. I mean, do you want to throw this in? Yes, no. I just don't want it to be a default. That's right. Okay, that's that's the problem. And for the the, the people that are selling a house, I, I think the better way of communicating this to them is say, you know what? Let them pay for the home warranty if they want it. The buyer. All right? Don't just throw it out there. Let them make that part of negotiating chip. Because if you're getting four offers, if you get into a little bidding war, why commit to a, uh, throwing in the home warranty on your initial, uh, you know, it's like throwing in appliance included, warranty included. Why even throw that in on the front end? Yeah, unless they're paying for it. So if I got two offers, one's a hundred thousand, and one and they don't want a warranty, and the other one wants a warranty, that offer better be a hundred thousand plus five hundred. Exactly, exactly. And this is where it's it's not personal; it's business. We have a right. seller's market, and the Cleveland realtor people have to look at things differently. They still have a lot of bad habits that they got to wash out of their heads where they're automatically throwing in a home warranty, okay? Or they're automatically throwing this in, or they're automatically throwing. No, it's, a, it's the Wild West now. All right, final thoughts. 
Yeah. I, you know, the thing is, Mike, I think to kind of encapsulate this, you know, we go back to the opening line of uh, from the Godfather. It's not personal, it's business. I think that we get in ruts, especially here in Cleveland, because things are so stable and dare I say stagnant in Cleveland. And I think that uh, people like realtors tend to get into those ruts, you know, myself included. And we got to we got to realize things are changing and you've got to adapt or like the reference I made earlier, the, the agents who didn't adapt to 2008 went extinct. Yeah. Yeah. Well that, you know what, that that's true for everything. You know, I mean, people going to, uh, you know, one of my rants will probably be in another podcast, but my final thought is this, you know, you have to change. Change is so is, is one of the constants in life is change. Things are always changing. You know, the real estate market is one thing, but, you know, going to college, really going to college for what? To get a uh, journalism degree? You think you're going to go and work in a newspaper? (laughs) No, it's not happening. Or, but, you know, how do you get educated? What degrees do you get? You know, how is the market changing? You're doing more Zoom, you know, the impact on commercial real estate, going to the office, all the, you know, DoorDash, uh, eating out, eating in. Uh, all these things, everything is changing. So to be successful, you, you know, in real estate is to understand all the the new dynamics that are happening here. And when you work with the realtor, when somebody comes in and said, I want to work with a realtor, it's like when we were talking about with those rookies uh, on our previous podcast, you know what, you've got to separate yourself from the pack. Because if you're still mild on these cliches, why should they hire you? What, what new stuff are you offering them? So, yeah, it's uh, not the, the I coach, coach says it's not the strong who survive. It's the one who adapts, who survives. Right. Right. Yeah. And that's why Bill Belichick's won so many Super Bowls. They always adapt at halftime. And all of a sudden, you know, Belichick's not locked into his scheme. His scheme is evolving. Anybody know what Bill Belichick's scheme is? Who guys who follow people who follow sports? He has no scheme. You know what his scheme is? Win the game. That's his scheme. So when you're when you're selling a house as a seller, as a seller, there are so many options now to selling to consider. And the and one of the things that's got to change is these five page contracts get that the the seller will get like we've gotten from your group and your group's great mike no, no question about it but it's like reading a mastercard ever read those uh charge card things i mean you gotta you you, you gotta get a, not even a magnifying glass you know to read all all the things you're checking here you're checking there they're checking there there really should be almost like you're renting a car you decline insurance, yes, no, something there that, oh, oh, wait a minute. Okay, listen, I want you to pay attention right here. This one here, we're giving them X, all right? You know that it's not just the price, but we're giving them X, Y, and Z. And, and bring that out in bold, highlighted in yellow, double check mark. So at, just from a seller standpoint, am I making any sense, Mike? You, you clean this up. I, you know what, I agree with you. The, of course, because of the climate today, you know, our contracts were never in my lifetime or not, never when I was in real estate, our contracts were one and two pages long. And of course, as more and more pe- people got sued, society has gotten more lit- litigious. Yep. They, oh, we got to add this clause now. And oh, we have to, title companies have to offer closing protection because somewhere, you know, someone's money got stolen by a title company. So unfortunately, while I agree with that, I think you're just going to see these things get longer and longer. Uh, but we've come up with a solution to that. And maybe that's another podcast or part of a podcast where we talk about the offer summary. You know, I think yes. that, have, and, and actually- left, yeah. Yeah. And this is not an original idea that, that, that I've come up with, you know, you mentioned it and I've actually started doing some scouting around and there are some real estate teams who are doing these sort of summaries and it's kind of a cool idea. So, you know, again, adapting to make things better and easier. Right. Right. Exactly. Okay. We covered a lot of good stuff here. We sure did. uh, uh, All right, Mike, I'll let you get going and everybody, 
we're going to start accelerating these podcasts. You're going to see them coming out fast and furious. So, so have a good weekend, Mike. We'll yeah, talk Mike, to you later. T- uh, take the gun or take the cannolis, leave the gun. <laughs> I, I will. Don't, don't get me started. Don't get me started <laughs> on a movie. I, I know that whole script. All right. <laughs> See you later, everybody. All right. Thank you for listening to the Cleveland Real Estate Investor Podcast. You can find all of our episodes at www.riley-properties.com, or you can find us on your favorite streaming services like Apple Podcasts, Overcast, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, and more. If you have any questions or topics or anything that you'd want us to cover in our next episode, please feel free to email us at thecleveland real estate investor at gmail.com.